All right, uh, our next lecture is about viruses. We talked about viruses briefly right at the beginning when we were going through the different types of microbes, but this will be uh, more details about viruses. Now, viruses are fundamentally different than the other microbes that we've talked about. Um, in fact, we've known that they've been around for quite a while. Even Pasteur originally postulated that there was something smaller than the microbial cells he had seen. He knew that he could pass uh, he could pass serum through a filter that would catch bacteria and other microbes, and yet even after that that serum had been filtered, it was still infectious. So early on, he postulated the idea that there was something smaller than a bacteria that could cause a disease in humans. And he actually coined the term viruses. So Louis Pasteur, again, always involved in really everything in early microbiology. So viruses, some novel properties here. They are really different than the other organisms that we look at. Uh, many, much of this will be review. Viruses, of course, are obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot multiply on their own. In fact, if we look at viruses, they're completely inactive outside of a host cell. On their own, they're nothing. Um, they're only active when they have a host cell. And of course, they are parasites causing damage to that host cell, and intracellular, meaning inside of the cell. In fact, we'll see that how viruses work is they, they literally take over a host cell during an infection. They're going to take over that host cell and turn that host cell into a virus-making factory. That's the uh, life cycle that a virus goes through. They are ultra-microscopic, in other words, extremely small. Uh, they are much smaller than bacteria. And in fact, in order to see viruses clearly, you have to use an electron microscope. You cannot see them with a, a visible light scope. Now, as for the structure here, of course, there's no cells. Uh, in the viral structure, not a proke or a uke. Uh, in fact, they're just these little infectious particles. Totally inactive, relies on the host cells, enzymes, relies on the host cells, metabolism, uh, cannot provide any of those functions itself. If we look at the structure of a virus, what a virus is, is it's this protein coat that we call the capsid that surrounds the genetic information, so it surrounds the DNA um, or RNA of that virus. And again, multiply by taking control of the host cell, turning that host cell into a virus-making factory. So as a little comparison here, the size of viruses versus other organisms that we see um, in the background, in blue, is the smallest of all eukaryotic cells. That's a yeast cell. They're showing you size of a yeast cell in blue. Um, and then you can see sizes of some typical bacteria. Bacteria tend to be in the micrometer range. Here's a very small one, Streptococcus. Here's E. coli, kind of a typical length, two micrometers. That's Generally, bacteria are in the micrometer range. This is an extremely small one. Uh, Rickettsia is about as small as it gets when we talk about bacterial cells. And then viruses, you can see in comparison, are even smaller. Viruses are in the nanometer range, so extremely small here. Um, you can get about uh, a thousand or, or a couple of thousand of those viruses into each cell, so they are very, very small. How do we classify viruses? We went through the different kinds of eukaryotes and talked about how we classify them. How do we classify a virus? There's four different things that they think about when they, when they classify viruses, and we're going to go through each of these in more detail. This is sort of an intro slide on classification. Host range is first. Host range means what kind of organism uh, or tissue does that virus infect. That's the host range. It's an animal virus, or it's a plant virus, or it's a liver virus, or where, wherever that virus infects, that would be its host range. We can also classify viruses according to their type of genetic information. Um, many viruses carry DNA for their genetic information, just like cellular life forms do, but there are some that carry RNA instead, so we can call it a DNA virus or an RNA virus. 
the capsid structure, that protein coat, there are a couple of very common shapes that we see um, in viruses, and so we can classify them according to the shape of their capsid. And the last one there, whether the virus is enveloped or naked, some viruses have a membrane that surrounds their capsid, and then we call it enveloped. Some viruses don't have that, and we call it naked. We're going to go through each of these now and talk about it in some more detail, one at a time. Let's talk about host range first. <coughs> Excuse me. So host range. Host range is the spectrum of cells that a virus can infect. So exactly what kind of cells does that virus infect? That's what is called the virus's host range. Now what controls host range? There are really two different things that controls which cells a certain virus can infect. One is a very specific interaction between what we call spikes on the virus, and those spikes interact with receptors on the host cell. And a particular virus can only infect the cells that have the correct receptors for that virus's spikes. So it's sort of a lock and key interaction. On the surface of the virus is this spike, and the spike binds to a very particular receptor found on the host cell. The virus is only going to infect the cells that have the right receptor for its spikes. So that's the first thing that controls host range is spikes on the virus and receptors on the host cell, and the virus only infects those host cells with the right receptors. The second thing is for that virus to go through its life cycle, the host cell has to contain everything the virus is going to need for its replication. It's going to have to have, the host cell has to have all of the enzymes and all of the metabolic pathways and all of those things that the virus will need for its replication. Those two things control host range. Now there are viruses that infect all kinds of organisms. There are bacterial viruses, and there are plant viruses, and there are animal viruses, and viruses that infect all different sorts of uh, host cells. And of course what controls that is largely the spike receptor interaction and whatever substances the virus needs inside of that host cell. Some viruses infect only one species, and other viruses will infect multiple species. For example, <coughs> if we look at something like um, HIV, HIV very specifically only attaches its spikes, the spikes on HIV, only attach to receptors found on human T cells. So HIV only infects humans. It will not infect anybody else because only humans have the right receptor for that virus's spike, uh, making HIV a human specific virus. But there are other viruses that infect multiple species. For example, rabies. The rabies virus, the spike on that virus can bind to a receptor found on all sorts of different mammals. So therefore the rabies virus can infect humans and dogs and bears and wolves and raccoons and all sorts of different mammals because many mammals have the correct receptor for the uh, rabies virus spike. So could be one species, could be multiple species. Maybe one tissue, or it could be multiple tissues inside of the host. Something like the hepatitis viruses in uh, humans, the spike on the hepatitis viruses specifically interacts with receptors found on liver cells. So therefore, those viruses only infect the liver. But there are other viruses that can infect multiple different tissues, and so it can spread and cause infection in multiple different places. Again, it depends on what receptor that virus's spike attaches to. So you could call a virus a, um, you could name it according to its host range. It could be a human virus or a plant virus. It could be a liver virus if it only infects the liver cells. That's one way to classify viruses. The virus is genetic information. Uh, generally, viruses are extra extraordinarily small, and likewise, their genome is very, very small. They, they contain somewhere between 
five to at uh, the high point maybe a hundred different genes that's that's at the very most uh, so they don't carry very much genetic information but their genetic information could be DNA remember most uh, organisms on the planet in fact all cellular life forms on the planet carry DNA as their genetic information likewise many viruses have DNA as their genetic information there are some exceptions however there are some viruses that carry RNA as their genetic information this is the only place you find it is in the is in some viruses it's not in any cellular life forms um, the DNA or RNA could be single-stranded or it could be double-stranded uh, single-stranded DNA you can see the designation here for single-stranded DNA, or it could be double-stranded DNA, it could be single-stranded RNA, or it could be double-stranded RNA. So we can name a virus according to what kind of genome it has. It has a single-stranded DNA genome, or it has a double-stranded RNA genome. You could name it um, according to what kind of genome the virus has. Um, most viruses carry their genome in one continuous piece, but there are some that have segmented genomes. They carry their uh, genome in individual pieces called, or segments. For example, influenza is like that. So you could call it a segmented genome virus if it's one of those very unusual ones. And that's another way to classify it. Classify it according to its type of genetic information. Uh, Single-stranded, double-stranded, DNA or RNA. And possibly it would be a segmented virus that has those individual pieces um, of its genome. The capsid structure. Uh, we can also classify viruses according to their capsid structure. Um, all viruses, <coughs> excuse me, I would have paused it, but then you'll get that crazy loop effect, so pardon me while <laughs> I sneeze. Anyway, a capsid. Um, all viruses have a capsid. The capsid is that protein coat that surrounds and protects the genome of the virus. All viruses have a capsid, and the capsids are made up of little um, individual subunits called capsomeres. Uh, and that's protein. These little protein capsomeres come together to form this structure called a capsid. Um, now, it turns out there are a couple of very common structures to see uh, in these capsids where you see them over and over and over again. So we can describe viruses according to what kind of structure their capsid has. For example, one of the most common ones here, this is called a helical capsid. A helical capsid is a long, hollow tube. The capsid forms this long, hollow tube, and the genome is curled up inside of that protein capsid. That's a helical virus. Again, helical viruses are long, hollow tubes. Uh, that's what their capsid looks like, and the genome is curled up inside. <clears throat> Another option here are the icosahedral viruses. An icosahedron is a 20-sided shape. Many viruses will take on this 20-sided shape. Right? Uh, if their capsid looks like this, we call it an icosahedral virus, and the genome is inside of it. So two very common structures here. You can describe a virus as being helical, or you can describe a virus as being icosahedral. The other option here, complex. A complex virus means that it's not helical and it's not icosahedral. It's some other shape. Okay. Uh, some examples of complex viruses here. Here's a couple different complex ones. Uh, notice here this is a complex virus with this complex capsid. I know this top of it looks a little bit like an icosahedral. But actually, the entire structure is its capsid, all the way down through this portion and, and all of these little tail fibers. It looks sort of like a lunar landing module. Right? The whole thing is the capsid. So this isn't truly icosahedral. It's definitely not helical. This is a complex virus. It's neither of those structures. 
Uh, here's another complex virus. The capsid forms this sort of jelly donut structure with the uh, nucleic acid, the genome, inside of this capsid. Again, not helical, not complex, therefore this is a complex virus. Uh, this one, by the way, is a pox virus, so it's like a smallpox virus. Now, you'll notice this virus also has a piece of membrane surrounding the outside of it. We call that an envelope. Some viruses have this extra layer of membrane that covers their capsids. Some viruses do not have that. Um, if the virus has this membrane surrounding the capsid, we call it an enveloped virus. If the virus does not have this membrane surrounding its capsid, then we call it a naked virus. And so you can call a virus enveloped or naked depending on whether or not it has that membrane. Now, in general, the membrane does provide sort of an extra layer of protection against the outside environment, so envelope viruses uh, can be a little bit tougher to kill than naked viruses. So where does this envelope come from? Um, those viruses that have an envelope, you see the envelope on this side, those viruses that have an envelope, that envelope is actually part of the host cell's membrane. And in a few minutes, we're going to see that the virus pinches off part of the host cell's membrane to make its envelope. So if the virus is, a, is an enveloped virus, it got that envelope from the host cell's plasma membrane. Now, while we're here, sometimes students get confused. I told you a few minutes ago about spikes. Remember, spikes are necessary for the virus to attach to a host cell receptor. Absolutely essential for that virus to be able to go through its infectious process. Viruses have spikes, rather they are enveloped or naked. If they're enveloped, those spikes are actually in the envelope. They're actually embedded into that, that uh, membrane structure. If the virus is naked, then the spikes are sticking off the surface of the capsid. I added these little spikes to this picture, hopefully, so that you won't get confused. Um, there are spikes, regardless of whether the virus is naked or enveloped. There are always spikes. Right? And spikes are needed for attachment to a host cell during an infection. So using these terms, um, the, the host range of the virus, the genome descriptions of the virus, the capsid descriptions, whether it is enveloped or naked, here's some examples of viruses. For example, here's a picture. This is the first virus that was ever identified, the tobacco mosaic virus. As you look at it, contemplate what kind of capsid does this virus have. This is a helical capsid. Remember the long, thin tube is a helical capsid. Uh, we can't see the genome in this picture, but in fact the genome would be curled up inside of that long, hollow capsid tube. It's a helical virus. It is also naked. There's no envelope surrounding it. On this picture, this is also a helical virus. See the, the capsid here in blue uh, with the genome curled up inside but it's also an enveloped virus. So you're seeing this helical capsid curled up inside with membrane around the outside. Right? This is influenza. It's an enveloped helical virus. Here's the envelope with the spikes embedded in it. And here's the capsid, the helical capsid, with the yellow genome curled up inside. And this is an electron micrograph of HIV. You really can't see clearly in this picture, but I'll tell you it is an icosahedral virus. Uh, it is that 20-sided structure with the genome inside there. Inside in the red section is the genome. It does have an envelope. You can see the envelope here in green, this membrane that surrounds it uh, that originally was part of the host cell and actually gets pinched off during its infection cycle. Now some taxonomy terms. Um, we can't really classify viruses the way we do other organisms on the planet. They're not truly alive. They're not truly life forms. However, we do have a classification system, a taxonomic system, uh, to help you identify the individual viruses. 
here's here's how they do it. When they talk about a family that in, includes many different viruses, they always end the name in viridae. So herpes viridae is a family that includes many different viruses. One step down uh, in the genus level, they always end it with the term virus here. So herpes virus is the genus level, or like a genus level. And then species, and if there are subspecies, then you would have individual names, individual terms, so, such as the human herpes virus 1, or human herpes virus 2, human herpes virus 3. Um, and that's a, one particular individual virus. There are many of those in one genus, the herpes virus genus, and several of those genera in one family, herpes viridae. So, what I would expect is if you saw a term that ended in viridae, you would know that we're talking about a, a whole group, a family of viruses, not one particular virus. And lentivirus, that's also a group that would contain multiple different uh, viruses. If we're talking about only one virus, then it would have the individual terms here, like human immunodeficiency virus 1. That's one particular virus that's in this genus called lentivirus. Let's go through the life cycle of a viral infection. Now, we're going to talk about the life cycle of a bacterial virus first. We'll see it's very similar to the life cycle of an animal virus, so, but uh, it was the first that was identified. We're going to go through this one first, and then we'll go through and talk about how animal viruses are a teeny bit different. All right, the, the steps here, and by the way, the virus that we're looking at is called bacteriophage. Bacteriophage just means a virus that only infects bacteria. Now stop for a moment and contemplate, why would that virus only infect bacteria? Hopefully you are remembering that viruses can only infect whichever host cell has the right receptor. Well, it turns out that these viruses, the bacteria of age viruses, their spikes attach to a receptor only found on bacteria. So bacteriophage is not harmful to you, but it is deadly to a bacteria who has the right receptor for bacteriophage's spikes. All right, here's the steps here um, of, of a bacteriophage's life cycle. First step, adsorption. During adsorption, the spikes on the virus attach to the host cell receptors. All right, so I'm an adsorption, spikes on the virus attach to the host cell receptors. Next step, penetration. In penetration, the virus's genome enters into the host cell. In penetration, the virus's genome enters into the host cell. Notice, does the entire virus enter into the host cell, or is it just the genome? And the answer, of course, is it's just the genome. In fact, bacteria viruses escort their genome into the host cell, sort of like a syringe, uh, the capsid never enters into the bacterial cell. The capsid is just going to fall off the surface here. So we have adsorption where the spikes on the virus attach to the host cell receptors. We have penetration where the virus inserts its genome into the host cell, the bacterial cell here. Next is I call synthesis. Synthesis is where we have replication of the viral genome and production of the viral proteins. So you can see the genome here is being replicated. You're seeing copies. Viral proteins are being produced as well. All of that's happening during this synthesis phase. And the really important thing to remember about synthesis is that the host cell's enzymes are doing all of this for the virus. So in synthesis, you have replication of viral genome and production of viral proteins using the host cell's enzymes and ribosomes. And it's the host cell that's doing all of that work. Next step is assembly and maturation. I'm connecting these two together. 
in assembly and maturation, you have the new viral capsids uh, are put together and the genome is loaded inside to make new viruses. So assembly and maturation, the new viral capsids are filled with the new viral genome and then release. Uh, in release here, the host cell bursts open and the viruses leave. And of course, that kills the host cell. So release the viruses, leave the host cell and destroy it on the way out. So if we work through this cycle once again, here we have adsorption, spikes on the virus attaching to the host cell receptors. Next we have penetration where the viral genome is squirted into the host cell. Next we have synthesis where we have copying of the viral genome and production of viral proteins all using host cell enzymes and machinery. Then we have assembly and maturation where the new viruses are assembled together. The genome is loaded inside of the new capsids. And then we have release where the new viruses burst out of the host cell and they kill the host cell on their way out. Because this whole cycle ends in the lysis or destruction of that bacterial cell, this is called the lytic life cycle because the host cell is lysed and killed during this life cycle. In fact, we can see evidence of this, which you're looking at here. Um, and by the way, if you're having trouble seeing this picture, you may want to lower the light in whatever room you're in. Um, that will help you to see it more easily. But what, what you're seeing here is a bacterial lawn. What the researcher did is they melted some auger, 100 degrees boiling to melt the auger, brought it back down to a safe temperature, 50 degrees. They put some bacteria into that auger and then poured it onto the plate. So they created this bacterial lawn where there's bacteria growing all over the surface of this plate. And you can see the cloudiness is the bacteria growing over the surface of the plate. Then what they did is they put a couple of viruses onto the surface. Well, the virus, each individual virus will find its host cell, absorb, penetrate, synthesize new viruses, mature those new viruses, and then release and kill the host cell and those viruses go off and kill the neighboring cells. And then those viruses from the neighboring cells go off and kill the neighboring cells and eventually you get this little zone of death where the viruses have killed all of the bacteria in that area. And that's what you're seeing here. Each little clearing in this, this bacterial lawn is where one virus started this cycle and now there's so many dead bacteria that you can actually see a clearing. We call those clearings plaques, P-L-A-Q-U-E-S. So a plaque is this kind of zone of death, and each one represents where one virus started the infection, and eventually enough bacterial cells have been killed that you can actually see those openings in the lawn. Um, those are plaques. So. This is the lytic life cycle. This is destruction of the bacterial cells by the bacteriophage, this bacterial virus during this cycle. Now it turns out there is another option. This is the lytic life cycle, but there is one other option, and that's called lysogeny. It turns out that some bacteriophages can insert their DNA into the host cell chromosome. This is sort of going dormant into the host cell chromosome. This would happen after adsorption and penetration. So if you think to, back to the life cycle here, bacteriophage approaches its host cell, binds its spikes to the host cell receptor, penetrates, putting its genome into the host cell. Now, the genome here, the viral DNA in red, the chromosome of the cell in, I'm sorry, the viral genome in blue, the chromosome of the host cell in red, some viruses can actually take their genome and insert it into the host cell's genome. So their DNA gets incorporated into that host cell's genome. We call that lysogeny. Um, the virus has gone into lysogeny. It's gone dormant in the host cell chromosome. 
Now, why would it choose to do this? Usually it depends on conditions. Um, the viral DNA can go into the host cell chromosome and it can hang out there. As long as that host cell is strong and healthy, then the bacteriophage's DNA will stay there inside of the host cell's chromosome. It will stay in lysogeny. If the host cell begins to get sick or die or run out of nutrients, then it can pop that genome back out, go back the other way here, and the virus can pop its genome out and exit lysogeny. Let's look at how that happens. So here's the option here. On the outside, you're seeing the lytic life cycle that we saw before, right? Uh, on the inside, I'm showing you this other option of lysogeny. So the bacteriophage, his spikes bind to host cell receptors. Next, we have penetration where the genome enters into the host cell. Now the virus has an option. It can either insert its genome into the host cell and enter into lysogeny, or it can continue through the lytic process. Now what controls which pathway the virus goes? If the host cell is strong and healthy and in a good environment, then the genome will go, of the virus will go into lysogeny and incorporate into the host cell's chromosome. If the cell is not in a good situation or it's not strong and healthy, then the virus will continue through the lytic life cycle. That's generally what controls it, is environmental conditions. So if we think about why is this, why does the virus make this choice to go into lysogeny in good conditions? Well, remember, if the virus's DNA is part of the host cell's chromosome, then every time that host cell goes through cell division, all of the daughter cells will also have the virus in their DNA. So this is a way of replicating yourself inside of this good host cell without any work whatsoever. Now, if the virus senses that this cell is getting sick or this cell is not in a good environment, then what it will do is exit lysogeny, right? go back through the lytic life cycle, kill that cell, and all of these viruses are going to search for a better host. So it's a way of either staying with this cell because it's healthy and strong and in a good environment or abandon ship and look for a better cell if that cell is not in a good situation. Now for the cell, you know, there's no good outcome here. Either way, the cell eventually is going to die from this viral infection. Um, but the virus can choose whether it wants to stay in that cell or kill the cell and look for a better one. So that's lysogeny, putting uh, your genome into the host cell chromosome. Now again, not all bacteriophages do this. Some can, some can't uh, go into lysogeny. So this is the basic life cycle of a bacterial virus, the bacteriophage. It can go through the lytic life cycle, and some can go through the lysogenic phase where they enter into the host cell chromosome. Let's now talk about some animal viruses. Now, Animal virus replication is very similar to bacterial virus replication, uh, and the life cycle is very, very similar. There's just a few differences that I'm outlining here, and then we'll look through the, the sequence of events. First difference, animal virus replication is more complex than phage replication because animal cells are more complex than bacterial cells. We have organelles, we have membranes, we have different sections of the cell. Uh, so indeed, it is a more complex cell, and therefore the virus process is a little bit more complex. A major difference between animal viruses and bacterial viruses. Animal viruses cannot inject their DNA. Remember, penetration of the bacteriophage was um, the DNA getting squirted in to the host cell. That's not how it works in animal viruses. The whole virus is going to enter the host cell uh, during the animal virus replication cycle. We just finished talking about lysogeny and bacteriophage where the chromosome of the virus can get incorporated into the host cell's chromosome. Well, it turns out that the same thing can happen with animal viruses, but unfortunately they have a different term for it. Lysogeny, the term we just learned, is what they use when they talk about bacterial viruses or bacteriophage. The term is latency when we talk about animal viruses. 
It's exactly the same phenomenon, but a different name, unfortunately. So latency is the term for uh, animal viruses going latent in the host cell chromosome. Let's look at how this works. The replication cycle here. Uh, many of the same steps, just a, a, just a few differences. So we'll go through it one step at a time. And step number one here at the top, we have adsorption. Adsorption is spikes on the virus attaching to host cell receptors. Right? Next, we have penetration. Penetration is different in an animal virus than it is in a bacterial virus because remember in penetration, the entire virus enters into the host cell. That's not what we saw with bacteria. So in an animal virus, the entire virus enters the host cell. Because of that, there is one additional step that we did not see before called uncoding. Uncoding is removing the virus's capsid to release its genome. Uncoding is removing the virus's capsid to release its genome. That step didn't happen with bacteria. That only happens in animal virus replication. But once we have uncoding, then we see the same sort of process. Synthesis. Synthesis is the replication of the viral genome, production of virus proteins, all of that again using host cell machinery. Host cell enzymes, host cell ribosomes are used in the process. Then we have assembly. Assembly is the uh, building of new viruses. The genome is loaded into the new capsids and release. The new viruses are leaving the host cell and killing the host cell on their way out. So the animal virus replication cycle, similar, just one extra difference. Um, here we have adsorption, spikes on the virus, host cell receptors, penetration, the whole virus enters into the host cell, uncoding is stripping off the capsid to release the virus's genome, synthesis is production of new viral genome and production of viral proteins all using host cell machinery. We have assembly, which is the building of new viruses. You, you put the new genome inside of the new capsids and release the new viruses, leave the host cell, and kill it. I'm going to go through a couple of these steps in more detail um, just quickly here. So in adsorption, you know, I, I feel like I've beat this dead horse. You guys are with me on this. Adsorption, of course, is spikes on the virus attached to host cell receptors, right? Of course, this is what controls uh, host range, is the interaction between the spike on the virus and the host cell receptor. It doesn't matter if it's an enveloped virus or if it's a naked virus. Either way, you have spikes on the virus binding to host cell receptors. That's adsorption. Next step, of course, is penetration. This is one of the main differences between animal viruses and bacterial viruses. Uh, penetration, there, is a, a, there are a couple of possibilities here. Largely, the way a virus penetrates depends on um, whether the virus is naked or enveloped. Naked viruses enter in a vesicle. This process is called endocytosis. E-N-D-O-C-Y-T-O-S-I-S, -S, endocytosis, uh, and the virus enters in a vesicle. Here you can see um, attachment has, adsorption or attachment has already occurred between spikes and receptors. Then that uh, host cell brings the virus in in a vesicle through endocytosis. Uncoding then happens inside of the cell to remove the capsid. If it's an enveloped virus, things are a little bit different. Uh, with an enveloped virus, here the virus comes up and attaches, spikes on the virus attaching to host cell receptors. Well, an enveloped virus, what it does is it simply merges its envelope with the host cell membrane, merging the two to together. As the envelope from the virus merges with the host cell membrane, get this arrow back, 
as the, the envelope of the virus merges with the host cell membrane, that literally dumps the capsid inside of the cell. Then the capsid is uncoated to release the genome. So if you're a naked virus, you enter through endocytosis and a vesicle. If you're an enveloped virus, then you merge your membrane, your envelope, with the host cell membrane to dump the capsid into the cytoplasm. That's generally how it works for, for um, penetration of animal viruses. So looking back here, um, absorption, right? Penetration is a little bit different depending on if it's an enveloped virus or a naked virus. And then we go through um, un uncoating, synthesis, release. Let's talk some more about release. Release is a little bit different depending on if it's naked or enveloped as well. So let's look at that more up close. Release is a little bit different. Um, the release of na naked viruses occurs when the host cell bursts open and all the viruses are released. Um, that's exactly the same as what we saw with bacterial viruses, where you build up a high concentration and then boom, the host cell explodes and all of the naked viruses are released. Right? That's how naked viruses release in this one big explosion killing off the cell. Enveloped viruses bud off the surface of the host cell. So here you're seeing an example. Here's assembly. Uh, the viral genome is being wrapped up in a capsid here. This is a helical capsid. And then the virus is budding off the surface of the host cell membrane. And that's how it gets its envelope, is actually by budding off the surface. Right? That's how envelope viruses are released, through budding. Um, we can see a picture here. This is HIV uh, budding off the surface of its host cell. And you can see assembly beginning here, right? Uh, and then as the host, as the virus is budding off the surface, it's picking up a little piece of membrane to use as its envelope. Now I want to stress a point here. Budding is just as deadly as the explosion that happens with a naked virus. The cell is going to die when viruses are released, no matter if they're naked viruses released in one big explosion that kills the cell, or if they're envelope viruses that are budding. This is just as deadly to the host cell. When you have hundreds of viruses budding off the surface of the cell membrane, that's going to kill the cell as well. So the cell is toast. Either way, it doesn't matter if it's a naked virus being released or an envelope virus being released. For some reason, students think that this doesn't look as, as dangerous um, as the explosion, but in fact it is. It is just as deadly to the cell. Cells dead either way. Now, how do we deal with viruses in the, in the lab? How can we um, grow them and work with them in the lab? Of course, viruses are difficult. Uh, viruses are difficult because you cannot grow them alone all by themselves. You cannot grow them in pure culture, of course, uh, because they have to have a host cell. Viruses on their own are just simply little particles that contain protein and genome and sometimes a little bit of an, an envelope. Uh, so they're very difficult to, to work with in the lab. So how can we grow them? There's a couple of different ways that that's commonly done. First is in, um, in cell culture. I have that in the bottom here, but you can see pictures of cell culture. Uh, one way to grow viruses is to grow them in cell culture. Uh, here's an example. These are mammalian cells on the left-hand side. You can grow mammalian cells in a dish, a plastic dish, sort of similarly to how we can grow uh, bacteria in a petri dish. And mammalian cells, it turns out, uh, really like to grow in one layer and they like to attach themselves to the bottom of their dish. They like to be attached to something. So as you're growing mammalian cells, they will actually spread out in a single layer across the bottom of the plastic dish and attach to that dish. That's how they like to grow in cell culture. Well, if you wanted to grow some virus, what you could do is put your virus into this cell culture and let the virus go through and kill off those cells, and that would allow it to produce more viruses. And here you can see evidence of viral infection. Notice the cells are being killed off. They're no longer one monolayer, and they're all getting clumped up together. Um, and and that's, that's evidence of a viral infection. You can see that clearly. 
Other ways to grow animal viruses instead of in cell culture, you can use a bird embryo, i.e. an egg. Um, eggs make wonderful places to grow viruses because there are lots of different environments inside of an egg, uh, lots of different tissues, and you could choose which tissue you want to grow your, your virus in, depending on what virus it is. And the shell of the egg actually prevents a lot of cross-contamination uh, or contamination of your culture, of your virus prep. So lots of viruses are actually grown in eggs. Uh, makes a, a very easy, controllable environment to grow your virus. And that's why currently many vaccines are actually uh, grown from eggs for this exact reason. Unfortunately for some viruses, you just cannot grow them in cell culture and they will not grow in an egg and so there's no other option but to grow it in a live animal. Obviously that's not the first choice, but unfortunately for some viruses that is the only way we have to grow them is to actually infect an animal and then collect the virus and infect the next animal. Now let's talk a little bit about viral diseases. We talked about viruses and the life cycle of viruses. Let's talk about how that affects a viral disease. Now, viral diseases tend to be a totally different beast than bacterial diseases or diseases caused by the eukaryotes. First off, diagnosis is much more difficult with viruses than they are with um, eukaryotic or prokaryotic pathogens. If you think about why, why is diagnosis so difficult? First off, of course, they're very, very small. You can't just see them. You can't just see the virus the way you might be able to see a larger pathogen. Also, remember viruses are intracellular. They're hiding inside of our cells making it much more difficult to identify them. Uh, viruses also, remember, can go into the host cell chromosome. They can enter into latency. That also makes it difficult to identify uh, a, a viral infection. So how can we diagnose them? Uh, they are difficult to diagnose, but what can we do to diagnose them? Uh, one common way is to look for characteristic cytopathic effects. Remember, viruses kill host cells, so you can look for evidence of host cell destruction, and that will help you to identify that perhaps it's a viral infection. And different viruses, because they have different host cell ranges, will kill off different types of cells. So you can look for destruction of one particular type of cell, and that will help you to identify it could be a certain type of virus. Sometimes you can screen for parts of the virus. Sometimes we can screen for a particular spike that will help us to identify if that virus is in a patient sample. Or we could screen for a particular protein or enzyme found only in that virus. That's one way we can screen for a virus. Unfortunately, again, they're extremely small and they're inside of host cells, so they're difficult to do that. Generally, what we do when we screen for a viral infection is we look for what are called antibodies. Antibodies are made by our body, our immune system, in response to an infection. Uh, generally how we screen for a viral infection is we look for evidence of antibodies. You only make those antibodies if you have been infected. So if you have antibodies against that virus, we know you were infected by that virus. And that uh, is generally the easiest way to screen for a viral infection, is to look for evidence that your immune system is fighting it off. Look for antibodies. Just like diagnosis is totally different with viruses, treatment is completely different uh, with viruses as well. If you think about antibiotics that we could use to target prokaryotic cells, that's not going to work with a virus. If you have an antibiotic that destroys peptidoglycan, that'll kill off bacteria, but that's not going to hurt the viruses because, of course, the viruses don't have peptidoglycan. In fact, there isn't very much at all to a virus's structure, making it very, very difficult uh, to find targets to kill off those viruses. So um, 
many of the targets that we commonly use during uh, as targets for antimicrobial treatment won't work with viruses. Also, antiviral medications often cause significant side effects. Hopefully this makes sense to you. If you think about the fact that viruses are inside of our cells, if you do successfully kill off that virus, it's likely to also still harm your cells. And in fact, that's why so many antivirals cause very significant side effects because they are harming not only the virus, but whatever cell the viruses are in. In fact, currently in modern medicine, we do not have any cures for viral infections. We do not have a single curable viral infection. Um, modern medicine is not capable of curing any viral infections. We have some drugs that will slow down the progression of viral infections. We have some drugs that will help your immune system fight off that virus, but we are not currently capable of curing any viral infection. All of the antiviral medications that we have um, either slow it down or help your immune system in the fight. They don't actually cure you. Uh, so we're really not very good at curing viral infections yet. Um, that's, that's an area where we need to, to beef up our, our arsenal against viruses. Other things to consider with viral infections here. Remember, some viruses exhibit latency. Latency is when the viral genome enters into the host cell chromosome. Latency is the term for that phenomenon in animal viruses. Lysogeny is the term for that ph phenomenon in bacterial viruses. But it's the same idea. The idea that the virus's chromosome can go dormant into uh, the host cell's chromosome. Now, what does that mean in a practical sense? Because viruses can go into latency, some viruses will cause recurrent infections, which means the infection comes out, and then it goes away, and then it comes back, and then it goes away. Um, the classic example here is a cold sore, which is caused by a virus, and we're going to talk more about that one in a moment. Um, but the infection comes out and you get cold sores and then it, the virus goes back into latency and hangs out for a while and then it will come back and cause another recurrent infection you'll have more cold sores and then the virus goes back into latency and back and forth it goes so you never really get rid of it the virus is just going in and out of latency um, some viruses of course exhibit latency which means sometimes you'll see these recurrent infections that occur uh, because of a viral infection that's, that's latent. Also because of latency some viruses are oncogenic which means cancer causing. Uh, anytime you mess with the DNA of a cell there is the possibility of that cell becoming cancerous. That's true anytime you mess with the DNA of a cell. Uh, anytime that that DNA is, is, is adjusted or altered or changed, there is the possibility of causing cancer in that cell. And indeed, uh, we're getting better and better at identifying links between cancer and viral infections. It appears that there are lots of different kinds of cancers that are brought on by uh, the fact that viruses are latent in a host cell. Surely you've heard about uh, HPV, the human papilloma virus that causes cervical cancer. It appears to be the causative agent of cervical cancer in, in at least first world nations. Uh, and that's a viral infection that goes latent in the cervical cells, the cells of the cervix, uh, and can come back to cause cancer later. So we're, we're now identifying lots of cancers that are brought on by viral infections because the virus goes latent in the host cell chromosome and can stimulate the, this uh, cancer to develop. Let's look at an example. Just like with the eukaryotes, we went through several examples of diseases caused by eukaryotic pathogens. I want to talk about an example here of a viral pathogen. We're going to talk about the herpes simplex viruses 1 and 2. Now the herpes viridae, this great big family of viruses called herpes viridae, has many human pathogens in it. We're going to talk about just these two for right now, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. 
Now these viruses are relatively large viruses. Remember how we identify viruses, their host range, their genome, their capsid, and whether they are enveloped or naked. So as you look at this virus, you'll notice that it is a double-stranded DNA virus. It is an icosahedral capsid, and it is an enveloped virus. And that's the structure here. So the herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 are large, enveloped, icosahedral with double-stranded DNA. Now HSV1 and HSV2 have a lot uh, in common with one another. We're going to talk about both of them one at a time here. HSV1, that is, HSV stands for uh, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. Herpes simplex virus 1 is known for causing cold sores. Um, and that's the, the common term for, for the sores that are formed by HSV-1. Um, let's talk a little bit about when you get it, how you get it, those sorts of things. So HSV-1 is transmitted generally through um, oral or respiratory droplets. So uh, oral contact or respiratory droplets can transfer at HSV-1. It is a very, very common infection. Again, I'm talking about HSV-1 here. Uh, it's a very, very common infection. In fact, by, by uh, middle age, as many as 90% of U.S. adults have been infected by HSV-1. Even if they never have cold sores and never show symptoms, 90% of us have been infected by HSV-1, even if we've never seen a cold sore. Uh, generally, that infection is acquired in childhood. Uh, it seems to be easily passed from person to person you know, by sharing forks or sharing drinking glasses or, you know, grandma kisses the baby and transfers uh, HSV-1 over. So it seems to be very common, acquired generally during uh, childhood. And Frequently, actually, HSV-1 is subclinical and patients don't see any effect, but the most common one here is this cold sore. Uh, this is the, the common looking cold sore. Herpes, by the way, means creeping rash in Latin. You can see why they named it that. It has that very kind of creeping look to it. Sometimes they're called fever blisters. Here at the bottom, you're seeing um, this is a more intense infection by the exact same uh, pathogen. This is also HSV-1, but it's infecting not just the oral mucosa, but actually the tongue and the soft palate and the insides of the mouth. So HSV-1, transmitted via the oral respiratory route, infecting the oral mucosa. Um, very, very common, acquired in childhood. HSV-2. HSV-2 generally infects the genital mucosa, the mucosal membranes of the genitals. It is acquired through sexual contact. Um, it is an STD, an a sexually transmitted disease, and so it is acquired generally as a young adult. That's usually when people get it, is as a young adult. Um, now, HSV-2 causing genital herpes here. HSV-2, um, on the right, in this, in this picture, it's a vulva, in this picture you're seeing classic herpetic lesions. They look similar to the cold sore lesions there. They're angry, irritated, painful lesions. Uh, unfortunately, genital herpes, HSV-2, is noted for its variety um, during an infection. In fact, Many times, doctors actually have to run an antibody test to identify for sure whether this patient has herpes because there's so much variety in how genital herpes presents itself. Uh, on the right-hand picture here, you're seeing the very classic herpes sores, angry, irritated, painful sores. On the left, looks like little teeny blisters. Um, that's also HSV-2, genital herpes. Sometimes herpes will present itself as just red, irritated spots. Sometimes herpes, genital herpes, will present as just little teeny slits in the skin. Huge amount of variety, and sometimes doctors have to do an antibody test to make sure of what they're dealing with. So HSV-2 gener generally infects the genitals. It's acquired via sexual contact. It's an STD. It's usually acquired as a young adult. Now, while we're here, I've been telling you that HSV-1 infects the oral and HSV-2 infects the genital. 
uh, but it is in fact possible for them to be in the opposite orientation. It's possible to get HSV1 lesions around the genitals and it's possible to get HSV2 lesions around the mouth. There is some crossover ability there. Um, I will leave it to your imagination on how that could occur, but yes, it is possible to get them in opposite locations. Now, the herpes viruses, unfortunately, do go latent. Uh, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 both can go latent or enter into the host cell chromosome, going dormant in that host cell chromosome. Um, and that happens in nerve cells. HSV1 goes latent in the trigeminal ganglia, uh, the ganglia of the brain here is where you'll see HSV1 going latent. HSV2 generally goes latent into the sacral ganglia, which are at the base of your spine, um, but it's always into nerve cells. So if you think back to the infection cycle, and I would encourage you to write this out um, while we're talking about it. HSV1 infects the oral mucosa goes latent in the nerves of the brain. HSV2 infects the genital mucosa and goes into latency in the nerves of the back. Either way, they've gone into latency. Now, because they're in latency, both of them can reemerge to cause future lesions. They can come out and then go back and then come out and then go back. Uh, so recurrent lesions are a hallmark of herpes infections, these herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 infections. So let's think about what could cause or bring on a recurrent infection. If herpes is latent in the nerves, what could cause it to come back out and cause a recurrent infection? Uh, one thing that can cause that is, is anything that affects the immune system. So for example, illnesses. If you have a cold or you get sick from something else, that can cause your immune system to go down and out pops herpes. Right? So in fact, that's probably why they called them cold sores or fever blisters because people would get them every time they got some kind of a cold or fever. So one thing that can stimulate a recurrent infection is an illness. Another one, hormones. It turns out that um, they've done several studies where if people keep track, uh, especially women keeping track of their menstrual cycle, shifts in hormones and recurrent infections, we see there is a link to hormones uh, that can uh, be documented showing that there are certain times in the cycle where it's more likely to experience a recurrent infection. So second thing that can affect recurrent infections are hormones. Next one, stress. Stress can cause herpes to come out as well. Stress also affects the immune system. So when a patient feels really stressed out about, say, their first micro exam. <laughs> so you're studying really hard and you're nervous and stressed about your first micro exam. Your immune system goes down a little bit and bam, out pops herpes, either one or two, whichever um, is, is, re is latent in the, in the host cell. Stress can definitely stimulate a recurrent infection. And the last one is not necessarily as obvious to, to people, but there has been a documented link. Uh, UV light exposure can also stimulate a recurrent infection. Uh, it appears that having UV light exposure, i.e. a bad sunburn, you get a really bad sunburn and that uh, causes damage to the cells and that stimulates a recurrent infection as well. Um, the organism travels back down the nerves and boom, causes an, a recurrent infection there around the mouth or genitals. Um, so we know that that has been linked to recurrent infections with HSV1. The link is not as clear with HSV2. Um, I suspect people don't get sunburns as often in the area um, where HSV2 will cause recurrent infections, so that's probably why we haven't been able to document it as clearly. But four things that we know are linked with recurrent infections, UV light exposure, stress, hormones, and illnesses can all, can all cause that. So again, these recurrent infections occur because of those, those different problems. 
and HSV2 comes out of latency, travels down the nerves, and bam, you get another cold sore outbreak, or bam, you get another genital herpes outbreak. And every time it goes away, it's not truly going away, it's going back into latency in the nerves, and it can come out and go back and come out and go back, um, just according to what's happening in the patient's life. Now the good news here, well, I suppose the bad news first. The bad news with herpes is, again, we cannot cure any viral infection, and in fact, we cannot cure herpes either. The good news is there are quite a few drugs now available that extend the time period between recurrent infections, and they shrink the time period of those infections. So our drugs do help the immune system, and they do keep this virus uh, from coming back as often. So in fact, uh, if you do suffer from recurrent infections from either herpes simplex 1 or 2, by all means go in and, and talk to a doctor because there are drugs available to help um, reduce the, the length of time of those recurrent infections. All right, so that's herpes. There are, unfortunately, a couple of worst-case scenarios with herpes. These are complications. Generally, herpes is a relatively benign infection, but unfortunately, there are some worst-case scenarios that can occur with HSV-1 or 2. At the top here, this is herpetic keratinitis. Uh, herpetic keratinitis is herpes infection of the optic nerve, so the nerves that, that uh, service the eye. Uh, unfortunately, what happens here is if mom is suffering from an active genital infection by herpes, as the baby passes through the birth canal, the herpes virus has gotten into the eye and is infecting the optic nerve and headed for the brain. Um, unfortunately, this is really serious. Um, this has gone to an encephalitis phase. Uh, 50 to 80 percent mortality rates for newborns who are born with herpetic keratinitis that travels to the brain. Um, really bad news, unfortunately. Even if the child does survive, the likelihood of full brain function is pretty low. So this is a very serious complication. Um, Mom, uh, moms to be who have active herpes infections absolutely need to tell their doctors so that, so that things can be done to reduce the risk associated with herpetic keratinitis. On the bottom here, you're seeing herpetic Whitlow disease. Herpetic Whitlow is herpes infection of the digits, i.e., the fingers. If somebody has any kind of a small cut, may not even recognize that you have that cut. But any kind of a small cut in or on the fingers, around the fingernails, HSV-1 can get into those cuts uh, and set up this herpetic whitlow or herpes infection of the digits. Now, looking at this, um, I want you to contemplate who do you think is at the highest risk for herpetic whitlow disease? Who's most likely to get herpes infections of their fingers? The number one highest risk for herpetic Whitlow are dental hygienists. Number two are nurses. Now the reason is because dental hygienists are constantly having contact with people's mouths and remember HSV-1 is, is present in 90 percent of American adults. So um, doctor or nurses and dental hygienists who have contact with patients all day are the number one to, to get herpetic Whitlow disease. So what can we do to prevent this? Wear gloves. Always wear gloves. Always wear gloves. You are protecting yourself as much as you are protecting your patient. Remember that herpes can be latent. In, in that patient, so they may not have an active infection. In fact, many times herpes is subclinical, so they may have no idea that they're even infected by that virus. Uh, but if you have any tiny little cuts in and around your fingernails, herpetic whitlow is a possibility, so you should always wear gloves when you contact a patient, period. All right, no excuse not to wear gloves. So. If I ever uh, get wheeled into an emergency room and I look up into your eyes and you're not wearing gloves, you better believe I'm going to lecture you right there. Um, you always wear gloves. You are protecting yourself as much as your patient. All right, um, this brings us to the end of material that's covered by Lecture Exam 1. 
so the uh, lecture exam one goes up through viruses, nothing else. Um, I encourage you to to send me mini review requests or mini lecture requests over anything up through the end of this lecture, um, so that we can do a little review and and hit anything that's a little bit confusing uh, week four during our lab time. Um, that would be a good time for us to do that. So, all right, I will see you guys next time.